Saturday. But um, it's observed early because November 1st is All Saints Day. It's the next Sunday we celebrate All Saints Day. This week makes it Reformation Sunday. Ah, all that explanation. Um, I won't be here next week. I've got a granddaughter that's getting confirmed at Trinity Lutheran Church in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, just learned that Kyle's mom was a member there. Kyle, were you a member there too? Nope, nope, I wasn't, but my mom was long standing back even when, before the church was uh, where it is now. She was okay. downtown back oh, in the day. Anyway. So that relationship is there. Granddaughter uh, Lila is getting confirmed, so uh, Pastor Roper will be filling in for me, and I appreciate that. We begin our worship with uh, the opening hymn, hymn number 657. <laughs>
we're sinners, confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most, most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, and grant us remission of all our sins, and by the Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and promise them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Amen. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end.
chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading this morning is from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 26. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all that have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propiti propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is also the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus. 
once again, reading from the 20th verse. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness, righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Gail and I unwittingly play a, a game from time to time. It's not that we decide proactively that we're going to play this game, but rather it comes reactively. The way it's played is you, you have an object. It doesn't matter what it is. You have an object. And you place that object in some location where you're not going to forget where it is. And then when it's time to retrieve the object, it isn't where it's supposed to be. And so begins the game of hide and seek. Well, eventually that which is sought is found, and there's great rejoicing throughout the household. Martin Luther was playing a similar game in his life. He was a convinced, confirmed, confident Christian in every way, except for one. He had a restless heart. He could not find peace in his own heart in his relationship with the God and Father of us all. He struggled to find that peace that passes all understanding. But the harder he struggled to find it, the further that quest came to be. That which he was looking for seemed to be hidden away in greater distance and in, in, a, in a place that he just simply could not come to. It's not that he didn't try to bring rest to his soul. He, he struggled very valiantly to make that happen. He prayed endless hours and read scripture for endless hours in a day. He pummeled himself with, with whips, with branches, with things that would subdue his flesh. He would confess sins over and over and over again. And finally, to the point that his confessor would say, Martin, you've already confessed that. You don't need to confess it again. But Luther's response would always be, but the sin is still in my heart. I can't find peace. He would lie prostrate on the altar floor for hours at a time, expecting that his self-punishment and self-humiliation would somehow bring about the peace that he was lacking in his life. Well, Obviously, that didn't work very well. It plunged him into greater and greater despair as he, he struggled with this thing called the righteousness of God, believing it to be something that he earned as a result of the works that he performed, and thus the self-punishment, the prayers, the scripture reading, the prostration, all of those things hoping that one day one of those things would be the key to having and finding the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He knew God to be a righteous judge. And he knew that the judgment of God was a righteous judgment, a judgment that he knew he deserved, and yet a judgment that he could not get away from. He knew and he deserved the wrath of God. But he knew at the same time from reading scripture that God is a loving and forgiving God. If only he thought he could find the combination that would make the two click. His sinfulness, 
and God's justice and God's forgiveness. While preparing a lecture on the Book of Romans for his students at the seminary in Wittenberg, as he was studying and praying as he always would, all of a sudden he looked at Romans chapter 1 verse 17 in a different way. He said later on, it was as if, as if the heavens, as if paradise itself had opened and the Holy Spirit came streaming into his life. In the verse, Romans 1, 17, for in it, that is in faith, the righteousness, righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And with that little word from Scripture, he was able to grasp the fullness of what it means to be a sinner standing before a righteous judge. It meant that, yes, of course, he's a sinner. He deserves God's condemnation, God's eternal judgment. He deserves hell as a result of his rebellion against God. But yet at the same time, he came to realize that there was a judge who judged him already. Not according to the good works that he would do, not according to his self-punishment, the prayers, and the Bible readings, and his confession of, of sins over and over again. But rather it was because God in Christ Jesus had come into the world to bring forgiveness and salvation to sinful human beings. And the way that hope and that, that righteousness is gained is simply by receiving the gift the Holy Spirit brings, the gift of forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. He came to realize that that was accomplished by Jesus dying on the cross, that God took the sin of Martin and laid it on the cross so that the death that Jesus died was the death for Martin's sins as well as the sins of the entire world. And as I said, it was as if the very gate of paradise opened before his eyes. So marvelous was that recognition that Jesus had come to bring forgiveness of sins. Later in life, in about 1940 or 1545, Luther described his experience in this way. I had already for years read and taught the Holy Scriptures, both privately and publicly. I knew most of the Scriptures by heart, and therefore had eaten the first fruits of the knowledge of and faith in Christ, namely that we are justified not by works, but by faith in Christ. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless. I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience. But meanwhile, I was walking at the door, door of this particular Pauline passage, earnestly seeking to know the mind of the great apostle, Day and night, I tried to meditate upon the significance of these words. The righteousness of God is revealed in it, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so suddenly, after years of struggle, years of doubting, years of hatred toward God, finally he realized that God had mercy on him, he began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift from God, something that God gives freely and without any kind of conditions. It's a gift that is given to the entire world, the gift, gift of the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. He wrote, now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and had entered paradise. In the same moment, the face of the whole scriptures became apparent to me 
My mind ran through the scriptures as far as I was able to recollect them, seeking analogies and other phrases, such as the work of God by which he makes us strong, the wisdom of God by which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. Just as intently as I had now hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I lovingly praised this most pleasant word. This passage from Paul became to me the very gate of paradise. With that realization, Martin Luther's game of hide and seek was brought to a conclusion. And as with every other game of hide and seek, that which was lost was right there in plain sight. The eyeglasses that you thought were put over here were put over here. The gifts that you had bought in August and found again in the following September, <laughs> the following September, a year later, the Christmas gifts that you wanted to give suddenly appeared in the same place where you placed them. The gift was there, but you just couldn't find it because you weren't looking quite in the right place. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The promise of salvation is found in that gift. Some people, including myself, call the letter to the Romans the Lutheran epistle, and I think there's apt. Luther said this about Romans, this letter is truly the most important piece of the New Testament. It is purest gospel, Christ for us. It is well worth a believer's, worth of uh, Christians while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Therefore, I want to carry out my service and with this preface, provide an introduction to the letter so far as God has, gives me the ability so that everyone can gain the fullness, fullest possible understanding of it. Up to now, it has been darkened by glosses, that is, explanatory notes and comments made in the margins of the text and by many a useless comment, but it is in itself a bright light, almost bright enough to illumine the entire scripture. As he said, it's well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it, but to occupy himself with it day to day. And so your assignment for next Sunday, and Pastor Oper will quiz you on this, <laughs> is to memorize the book of Romans <laughs> and plummet steps for understanding. And there, that which is hid is plainly, dis plainly revealed. The righteousness of God is found in Jesus our Savior. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in that faith to life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Raise up faithful pastors who will preach your word without fail and teach the doctrine delivered to the saints that many may hear and believe. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, your word has been the light and salvation throughout the ages. Help us to bring your grace to those in darkness and grant them freedom through the forgiveness of their sins. Bless the missionaries serving far and near and new congregations they establish in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of power and might, you have established governments and the order of law for the protection of all people and to provide the freedom to worship you in spirit and truth. Grant to Donald, our president, Gretchen, our governor, the Congress of these United States, and the legislature of our state, wisdom, humility, and integrity, that all may enjoy true justice and the protection of life from its conception to its natural end. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy and gracious God, your power is revealed chiefly in showing mercy to those in need. Give to the sick healing, to the troubled peace, to the grieving comfort and the dying peace. Hear us first on behalf of those who are ill, for David and Neil, for Carol, Roberta, John, Michelle, Martin, Courtney, Dwayne, Steve, Cindy, Bonnie, Kay, and Tim, as well as those who suffer from the coronavirus. According to your gracious promise, grant peace to those in tribulation and trial. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given great gifts to your people and provided resources to provide for their own needs and for the poor. Bless the agencies and programs of your church by which your people give aid and support to those in need. Help us to provide gainful employment to all people that they may enjoy the fruits of their labors and honor you with the works of their hands. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God and Father, your own Son has set aside his table for us to be satisfied in his feast forever. Bless those who receive the sacrament that through this gift all earthly divisions may cease and that we, we may become the one people that you have created us to be. Until that day arrives, preserve among us your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. We pray, gracious Lord, for those who serve you and serve us in, in so many different ways. First responders, police, fire departments, um, for the military, especially remember Hunter and Brendan, that you would keep them in your safety and bless them by your spirit's presence and the peace that it brings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Faithful Lord, throughout the ages you spoke hope through the prophets until that day when you delivered up your Son to be our Savior and Redeemer. Bless those who are just learning the gospel. Bless us with the desire to know and to keep your word. Encourage your people to avail themselves of the grace and confession and absolution so that they may forgive one another and live in the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God and Father, we pray that you would grant to us all good things that will benefit us in body and soul and prevent anything harmful us to, our, to us or our salvation. Teach us to live with the contentment with your will and purpose and in the freedom you alone can supply to serve you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as our Lord taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above, 
and that your word may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in confession of your name may abide to the end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Blessed be the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.